go ahead and get started. I will not spend most of my, you give me a five minute? Okay. I'm not gonna spend most of my time behind the podium. I kind of usually hate it there. Uh, this is, I'm giving a talk on building my own little world with open data. Um, that's me, and that's all the coordinates you can find me at. It's the Steve Zero, because I'm leet like that. Um, and that's actually even my email address at Red Hat. I work at Red Hat. Um, that URL at the bottom, this is Google Slides, so you can go ahead and copy that bit.ly link, and that'll get you right back to the slides, which has links in it. So, and there, it's also creatively common license, so you can mix this, remix it, whatever you want to do with the slides. And if you don't catch the picture of it now, um, it'll be on the last slide as well. And also, I know I'm not speaking Australian, so if I start to speak too fast in a foreign language like I'm doing now, please tell me to slow down, okay? Sound good? All right, should I warm up with some jokes? Because you guys are feeling like that pose. You want to, what do you want? Dad jokes or chemistry jokes? Yes. Chemistry jokes? Okay, so two atoms are walking down the street. One atom turns to the other one and says, hey, I lost an electron. And he says, are you sure? And he goes, yeah, I'm positive. <laughs> and then another one. Uh, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of chemistry jokes, but I really should bury them. <laughs> All right, it goes downhill from here, so get ready. Uh, so the goals for this talk are pretty simple. Can you guys see that font in the back? Not that I can do anything about it, but um, share some thoughts. A small, 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 small introduction to some data sources and some software. This is mostly about, this talk is not to like show off any software. It's mostly about taking data and trying to, oh, well, you'll see in a minute. Uh, show it in action. Talk about what I, and I'm very informal when I speak, so if anybody wants to give feedback or say, oh, I ran into that, or I didn't have that problem, I would love that. So that's why I put the we in there. Oh, and by the way, do not hold your questions to the end. I know that's good practice. I discourage that practice, because you'll forget your question by the time it gets to the end. And if you have a question about it, chances are there's about five to six other people in the room who have a question about it, and if I didn't explain something clearly, I'd rather clear it up at the point in time. I like to do, um, small sprints rather than waterfall, okay? So my talk is a small sprint model. Uh, future areas that I want to do with this application, it's definitely not done. And so now, I want to start with this premise. Open data is now the norm. Right? I don't think that when government sites or lots of other people who are publicly funded put out data, they think, oh, I'm going to keep this closed. I know for sure that's not in the United States. I don't know as much for Australia. I know for a long time your geo data was locked up pretty tight. You had that Canadian, British, Australian model, which was, we're gonna make money off our data. Um, is it now not the case here in Australia anymore? I think, I've been seeing it in Canada and I've been seeing it in lots of other places. Postcode and street data now that is public. A lot of it's public? Okay, well so they're open with it, but so then, you, it's inconvenient in that you have to write a little bash script that goes and pulls two gigs and two gigs and two gigs and then stitch it back together. But that's a data issue or cost issue, not a policy issue, which is much nicer than what it used to be, which is no matter what, unless you have $10,000, $20,000, you're not touching this data. And you can redistribute it now too, which is another big thing. Um, so the corollary that comes from this is this is not an open data talk anymore. I think that's, to me, that seems like kind of a boring talk now. I think, it, like, as we saw from the speaker before, governments are definitely buying into that data should be open. So I don't think I really have to give that talk anymore about why open data is awesome. Instead, this is about how to take some of that data and turn it into knowledge, right? And so I'm going to put my cards on the table to start with about, I'm highly opinionated about software architecture, so almost web, all web applications should be HTML front ends and REST services on the back end. I do not believe, sorry about your Drupal site, but I do not believe in putting a lot of server-side generated HTML code. I think that makes for a very fragile model and it's really cumbersome. So just, these are just, you have to take this as gravity, right? This is, there's nothing you can do about this. This is how I'm gonna build my app. I like microservices. Yes. So that's what the REST services are for, right? Machine readable. He was saying it should be, the data should be in a parsable format. I like microservices. I hate data portals. So again, uh, CCAN is a great project. It's made a lot of progress. But in general, I hate things like CCAN for myself. I find it to be highly unusable. I find it highly not what I want when I'm looking to answer a question. It's a good place if I want to go get data maybe, but then not what do I do with it? What kind of questions can I answer with it? So I like single purpose pages and apps rather than big data portals. 
And I call that for the win. So it, you might recognize that as small, loosely coupled, simple pieces, right? Which is very similar to what we like in Linux land. And so that's kind of how I want to build my web apps and my whole architecture. So gravity's done. Any questions on? No, no questions. Take that as a given. <clears throat> um, so most people don't care about data. I, we do, because we're kind of in this session probably, and there's some small groups at government agencies and librarians and statisticians. They do, but most people, they have questions. And they have questions usually, most of the questions, if you look, what was the first thing when Google Maps first came out? Well, for some of you, Google Maps has always been there. But for those of you who Google Maps first came out, what was the first thing you looked at? Your house. What does my house look like? And then you zoom around your neighborhood. Most people care about where they live. Or, and then the second thing is if you've moved, you probably looked at the house where you grew up, right? Or, oh, I love to take vacations here. Let me go look at that. You're not just like looking anywhere on the map, right? So people have questions about places where they live. And so I think that's one of the questions that I've used to try to frame what I bu I'm building for, that's why it's called, my own little world. So me, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me now, just a very little bit. But meet me at lunch or dinner and I'll tell you a whole lot more. Um, I live in Santa Cruz, California. It's a relatively similar climate to here. I, I'm an ecologist by training, so that first talk of today, where is our Frenchman? Oh, he left. That first talk of today was very exciting to me. I used to do that in a former life. Um, I love birding. Is that the same word that you use here in Australia? Because a hike is a walkabout, so I'm never sure what I'm supposed to call birding. A bird about? Bird watching? Okay, so I'm a birder. Uh, go, which means going out and spending time and money to identify and watch birds in nature. And weather matters to both people and birds, so weather matters to me. Like, I'm more likely to go birding if it's a nice sunny day than if it's a rainy day, and birds actually pay a lot of attention to climate. So there's a lot of research that shows birds can sense barometric pressure. So if they sense a storm coming, they can either come in off the water or they can put on fat reserves, and they'll be more active, and then once the storm comes, they shut down. So I thought I'd give you a nice, oh, I love exploring maps and data. So anytime I'm gonna do some sort of exploration, it's gonna be maps and data. And did any of you see this movie? Yes, was it a good movie? There, okay, so independent confirmation, Rotten Tomatoes 100%, um, go see this movie. It's a great movie about birding and relationships in general, but it also gives you the mind, I'm not that kind of birder though. The book is better. Oh yeah, well I always gotta have one of those in the audience. Don't read the book if you're gonna see the movie and vice versa. But the, I only saw the movie and it was a great movie, but I'm not that much of a birder. Um, please note all my source code and some of the data is at that GitHub URL. Again, at the end of the talk, I'll give you the URL for the slides and so then you can click on it, right? So, and it's all Apache licensed, okay? That's the great part about working at an open source company. I don't have to keep any of this secret. So what did I grab together? So, the first thing, since I wanted to do something with birds, this is eBird. This is a very large multi-year effort where it's citizen science, again back to the first talk today, um, where they go out and birders collect information on the birds they see and they submit it to eBird. Uh, there's the, the parent site, the US version is the parent site, and there's now also one in Australia. So if you want to go look, if you care about birds at all in Australia, and you want to go look and see where people are seeing birds and how many they saw, you can go there. And if you're a birder and you want to submit data, you can do it there. So I asked them for data. You have to email in specifically for, a date, for the data. And then there's pr quite restrictive licenses on it. I can show it to you, but I can't show it to you in a way that allows you to predict where you should go see birds. I'm assuming they're going to use that to make money for their organization. It's, an, it's a nonprofit, but like a bird guide, right? Um, I also cannot redistribute it to you. So that's why I said only some of the data is there. I cannot redistribute that data. It is open, but it's non-redistributable. Non I live near the coast, so the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, that's what NOAA stands for, puts out a whole bunch of data about every single one of their buoys that are sitting in estuaries and the ocean. And so they, and depending on the buoy, it'll take information on barometric pressure, temperature, a whole uh, influx of solar radiation, a whole bunch of different things. So that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because when you go to download all the buoy data, if you grab more than one, am I saying the word right for Australians? No, what do you guys call it? Boy? What's a small, what's, if I had a small son, what would I call him? I would say, hey. Boy. So they float in the water too, it's awesome. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the problem is depend, each, cent, each boy 
could have different data that it collects. And so when you download that data, it's not like this nice data sheet that's like all the same variables all the way down, right? It's changes. And so the, almost everyone, I was thinking of when I said ev almost, I was thinking of like Western Australia. Almost everyone lives near streams, right? So the USGS in the United States, United States Geological Survey, has a whole bunch of uh, monitoring stations along all the streams, and they have a bunch of data. Same problem with those, though. Each station collects different kinds of data, and actually, depending on what the station is better at, they can actually, even if it's the same variables, they'll switch the order. So you can't even assume that the order in the sheet, you have to actually grep the variables in the top. So that's fun. And so I would like to have put a screenshot up for this one, but I can't get to the county site from the Australian network, given what's going on right now. But um, most counties in the United States share the geographic information system data they've collected out with the public. So I went there to get a whole bunch of GIS data for my base layers, right? Because I'm going to, I'll show you the maps I'm going to use, but I wanted other things on top. Because base layers in, that we get in general are good for showing roads, but what if I care about some other question in my area? It's probably not going to be in Google Maps. Plus, I can't use Google Maps for free. Any questions about my data sources? We're all good? You get what I'm going to try to put together for now? All right. So lessons learned about data. I'm going to keep doing lessons as we go along. Redi you have to pay attention to the redistribution rights of your data. Just because you have access to it does not mean that you are then free to share it again. Or if you share it, you may have to, it's the same as software, right? You may be free to redistribute it, but you have to include the license or something like that. So this is actually one of the problems to building one of these kinds of portals in a standard way. I use the word portal, not meaning to. Metadata, metadata, metadata. Um, everybody knows metadata is data about data. Uh, not everybody knows that they should ship that as the download with their data. So quite often what you had to do was download the data and then look around the site and then download some PDFs. Or you might have to scrape a web page to try to figure out what the units were or when the data was collected or what the provenance was. I find that really, so for those of us in the audience who are government sites distributing this stuff, every time you give a zip of your download or you have the API, make sure you can point directly to the metadata or include it with the data because it's quite easy to download the data, forget to download the metadata, forget the URL that you downloaded it from, and four weeks later you're like, ah, I can't use this data anymore. I don't even know what these variables mean. Right? And I find this a problem with a lot of sites. Um, I love this one, times without time zones. So it turns out the USGS publishes their data with Greenwich Mean Time. So that's what, and, they give the, and then they give the time zone off it, offset. The eBird data, despite the fact that it's across the entire United States, they give no time zone data. So I'm just gonna assume, I mean, I, if I really wanted to spend my time, if this was like a professional site that I was doing or I thought people were gonna do real research off of it and I was doing multi-states, I would just write to them. But I'm just gonna assume it's in the time zone where the, it's like when the person turned their phone on and said or wrote down on their piece of paper, it's in whatever time zone that location is. So, but it's very common to get that. Um, getting con coordinates without a datum or a projection. So how many of you have worked with GIS data before or spatial data? A few of you. So this is actually, most people don't know this if they've never worked with spatial data that this is important. But it's critical actually. And the reason why it's critical is what, what's the shape of the Earth? Almost round. Almost round. See, this is where I love when they're, I can always tell the geo geeks in the audience because they never say a sphere, right? They say it's, it's a spheroid. It's, it's kind of oblong. It's egg-shaped. Um, it is, we can just say it's a sphere. What, how many dimensions is a map? Two. So there, whenever you take an orange and try to squish it to make it 2D, something has to give, right? And so what ha that's a projection. And then he, when he said almost round, there's lots of, the earth is bumpy. And depending on whether you're on a hill or in a valley, that actually ends up changing your coordinates when you go to smush. And so that's the datum, like what's your model of the bumpiness of the earth? So if you don't specify that with the data that you give, it's very hard for me to know what your, if the coordinates are some long integer, I have no idea what that is. And so it becomes very hard to figure out how to put that on something else. So this is another piece of metadata that you can often get into where they don't tell you what's the data and what's the projection. So things that you have to pay attention. So this lessons learned were things you kind of have to pay attention to, I guess. Is that helpful at all, any of these lessons learned? If you want to build with And again, so the thing about this is, I'm assuming you're not a large government agency. 
Some here work for them and use Drupal sites. But the rest of us are just developers that want to hack something together that answer a question or maybe at an organization. Or you're at a business and your business says, hey, we want a dashboard for looking at sales distribution. You have open data within your organization, right? You're building apps like this. And this is, I actually think these apps are nicer for everyday users, right? And I find them fun to build, so. Um, another suggestion is work with small chunks of data first. There are, for each data set, both the marine observations and the birds, there was 1,700,000 observations in each data set. And so this is actually something that has taken me years to learn, because I'm always gung-ho to try it on the whole data set. Um, and I've started to teach this my lesson to my kids. Don't try to do all of it at once. Try it on a little piece. So head-n is your friend. And catting, like outputting that to some text file, which you can then use. How many of you knew that head-n is available on PowerShell? None of you. And now you do. So tonight, at the, any of the mixers you go to for the rest of this, did you know that Microsoft actually included head-n in PowerShell? You'll be the hit of the party. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's big news. Why would you use that when you can use Bash? <laughs> Let's just say, OK. I'll get this question out of the way right away. I'm actually using Windows on my laptop right now. And oh, yeah, then you're using Sigwin. And I, when I'm on a platform, I like to be in the tools of the platform. I use it because. For, I'm a developer evangelist for OpenShift Online, which has nothing to do with this, and about 85% of our users are Windows users. And so I try to eat the pain before they do. So that's why I use Windows on and off. Because certainly no Red Hat engineer is going to test on Windows. So OK, now you've got data. Now what? You munge it. Right? Does everybody know what munging data means? Taking it, and so for this I use Python with the CVS module. How many of you have use Python for data munging and not use the CVS module. Good. How many of you have not, didn't know about the CVS module in Python? Best thing ever, especially if you have headers in the rows, you can just say, the first row is a header, the rest is all CVS delimited, and it goes whoosh, and it loads it all up in a big, nice data object with dictionaries for each. each you get a bunch of hash, well, what do they call Dictionaries, and a, an array of dictionaries. You mean the CSV module? What? You mean the CSV module? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't want to use that much. Yeah, forget subversion, forget Git. Right, we said we, walk, we work in small sprints here, right? So, real-time feedback. That's actually really embarrassing. There we go. All right, sorry about that. Um, is it playing? And then I get a platform up. And so this is, since I'm an OpenShift developer, I use OpenShift Origin, and I put it up in GCE. Does everybody know what GCE is? Google, contain, Google Cloud Engine, I think. GKE is their container engine. So this is like AWS, except in Google, right? Because I don't want to host my own servers, A. I don't want to set this up in my bedroom. I, my girlfriend is listening to the talk in the back. She's not, she, I don't know why she won't sit here. But she's listening, and she would be very upset if I was running a, you know, a 2U server in my work office all the time, both from a heat and an energy perspective and from a sound perspective. So I put servers elsewhere. Um, and what this does allows me to do is to start using Docker containers. How many of you have used containers? Okay, I would assume a lot had this audience. And so this made things really easy for me. And I'll show you what it looks like in a bit. And if you want to ask me questions about OpenShift Origin, I'll be here today and I'll be, probably be here on Wednesday morning and you can ask me something about it. And I can demo it and everything later, real demo it. And then you got to put the data somewhere. So this is where the containers actually came in really handy. Um, PostgreSQL with PostGIS. Does, has everybody heard of PostGIS? For, I'm not going to, I should stop asking that because I'm just going to tell you because there's probably two or three people who have not and I don't want to leave them in the dark. I know everybody's heard of PostgreSQL at this audience because it's the best database in the world and it's the only one anyone here ever uses unless they use Drupal, in which case they might use MySQL. Um, what? MariaDB. And right, in, the, in that case, they use MariaDB too. Um, PostGIS is a spatial blade for PostgreSQL. And it is the gold standard for, it's more respected than Oracle for its spatial blade. Oracle has a spatial blade as well. The gold standard is considered PostGIS though. So basically you put your data in and you can do almost, and this is not like just points on a map kind of data, like you can buffer off points and then clip that with buffers off another layer and then get the resulting areas and calculate areas and do, you can run, basically almost run entire geospatial models in the, at the database level. It's, it's got a steeper learning curve than something like Mongo, which does spatial as well. But you can do almost any spatial operation you want. 
Um, and so containers from Crunchy Data allowed me to do two lines of two little bash lines, and I loaded up an entire master replica database out of the box, just running. And so now I've got a master with two replicas, uh, write streaming, read streaming, whatever, for streaming replication going on, and I didn't have to figure out how to do that at all. So, and I can show it in a bit. It's just awesome. Do you guys want to see that, what it looks like in OpenShift? Yeah? I'll do it quickly. How are we doing on time? When did I start? We started at 20, 10 past? 20 minutes? Yeah. OK. So I don't want to spend too much time looking at this then. Um, this is what the console looks like, though. And I've collapsed everything down. So this is, I'm running all my containers inside of this. And so this is my master. And I've got one instance of my master running. Postgres doesn't really support multi-master very well. Right? That's my one instance of my master running. Does everybody see that? And then here, I'm running three replicas. So I've actually got one master and three streaming replicas set up there. And I can go, so the nice part about this is, with the, this is actually Kubernetes as well. Have you guys heard of Kubernetes? So OpenShift is basically Kubernetes++. It's the same model as the Linux kernel. Red Hat is using Kubernetes as our cloud Linux kernel. Does that make sense? Same, and same model, like we don't, we do everything upstream again, we don't control it, it's really a Google project, but we're the second largest contributor, so same model. So what's nice is this is a service, which means any of my code that wants to talk, I can just say, if I'm doing a read operation, talk to the replica. Don't talk to the master. And it'll round robin between each of the three running replica containers on its own without me having to do anything. So that made, the reason I bring this up is because for me as a developer, trying to set up master replica Postgres with PostGIS and getting all that configuring and running, I just would have given up and I probably would have done it wrong. Right? And for me, the nice part was I could build a more robust application without having to spend all my time trying to figure out how to get that going. If we have time, I'll show you that I can actually go into the terminal and make a SQL query. Okay? All right, let's go back to the slides. Anybody have any questions? No? Because I'm so clear? That's awesome. All right. Um, lessons learned on getting data somewhere useful. Right? Because data on my, in files on my machine is not so exciting. Um, moving a lot of data around takes time. I know that's pretty obvious, but you kind of forget it. So like every time I would make a schema change or something like that and I would re-upload my database, it would take, and I'm, in the United States we actually, so Graham on my team, do you guys know Graham Dumpleton? He's at PyCon Singapore right now. He usually comes to LinuxConf. Um, he always is complaining about his internet connections in Australia. Always. He's like, Your pi their pipes are the worst. So for me, I have 200 down and 12.5 up, and I was still complaining about how long it takes to move like a gig and a half of data up into the database. So, um, so do it with small data sets again to start with if you can. Try some or all of it locally first. So I tried this first by setting up a Postgres again locally, and that's how I generated my schemas and stuff. Um, with larger data sets, you do actually need to think about what and how you store stuff in the DB. So I'm gonna, this is, as a developer, do you guys usually think about that stuff? For most of my applications, I've never gotten to anything that has 3.4 million rows in the whole database. Do you guys usually deal with databases that big? No. You do? Where do you work? Yeah, okay, so open data organization, I, that kind of makes sense, right? But for a lot of developers, we don't deal with data that big. So, and so why would just make a database and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll make another column, I'll make another column, I'll make another column, and I won't even pay attention to what types I use, right? So for one example here, was location fields separately from the location column. So PostGIS actually can store data as location, which is a, a binary representation of the geometry. And so I was like, oh, I don't need to store the Latin long. I can always extract it later. I made that conscious decision because I was like, storing Latin long separately will cost me extra space on 1.7 million rows, and I might be disconstrained. Right? It would have been more convenient for me if I had stored them separately because then when I yank them out, I don't actually have to then unbin encode it and do all this other funky stuff with it. So sometimes you, you trade off stuff like that. And the other one was uh, build indices later. Right? Usually I just build my indices right when I make my schemas. This one I actually paid attention and was like, okay, what am I actually going to end up querying in at the end? I don't want to build an indice on that until I actually have to. I know most people do this normally with a lot of their applications. I just don't. My applications are never that big that I care. Which is a whole other thing that I could talk about, but I won't. Um, 
containers with a platform can remove a lot of install yak shaving. And, but I'm very clear here, this is about the installing of the yak shaving. Does everybody know what yak shaving is? No, not everybody. Okay, so that's a yak, right? And the story goes, and I forget where this, this was on some mail, internal mailing list in the, either the BSD world or something like that. And the idea was, um, you, you live in Alaska. Does everybody know it's cold in Alaska? Yeah, okay. So you live in Alaska in the middle of the winter and you wanna go get your mail. So you gotta go put on a sweater. Oh, but you don't have a sweater. Oh, well, to make a sweater, you actually need yarn. You're going to need to knit it. Oh, well, to knit it, you need some yarn. Oh, well, you don't have yarn, so you actually have to go outside and shave a yak to get, the, to get the, the fur, to make the yarn, to do the knitting. So you spend your first two days shaving the yak, and you still haven't checked your mail, right? And I think a lot of us, especially those of us who are not systems administrators and who are just developers, can relate to yak shaving, which is, I just want Postgres to work. I just want a mail server. I just want, I don't want, I, I'm gonna do the, like every time I set up Apache, I always knew I was doing, probably doing it wrong, and I was gonna be the next site that had leaked a whole bunch of passwords all over the internet. Like I don't want anything to do with that. I just wanted to write my code. So what happens with containers is it's not just laying down the bits, it's also the configuration too. And so that actually helps you get out of a lot of yak shaving, okay? Not all of it though, and I'll explain that in a bit. So now you have nice data in a DB, how do you analyze it? Non-spatially, um, I was gonna show Spark in containers, and there's an open source project called Rad, Rad Analytics to run Spark containers in um, a Kubernetes cluster, but I'm leaving that as a work in progress, because while I got those containers up and running, no problem, because it was, it's another line of JSON and it's all going and I've got my own cluster, uh, it's not as easy to get PySpark to talk through JDBC to the database. So I got stuck there and I ran out of time. But I wanted to show you a full demo. So in the future, if you see this talk again, I'll show you some Spark stuff. Uh, spatial, I just use normal PostGIS queries. Any questions? Does everybody know what Spark is? It's an in-memory analytic engine. It was, people were saying Hadoop is good, but it, it's slow for certain types of operations. What Spark is, is you write those queries, it loads all the data up in memory and does a whole bunch of optimizations and then gives you back all these really great things. And it works against Scala, Java, Python, and there's a whole bunch of other libraries. And you just talk to the Spark server in those languages, and then Spark does all the magic underneath. And it has machine learning libraries built in. It has a whole bunch more that, that Hadoop does not have built in. It's part of that whole ecosystem, though, okay? Um, great, analysis is done. How do we show it? So now this is, we're moved on to the next stage. So I built, again, a REST service. So I'm using Wildfly, which is the open source version of JBoss application server, uh, with Hibernate, Spatial, and Jax RS. I'm assuming nobody here is a Java developer. Is that correct? <gasps> Two? That's awesome. Three? Well, you work at Red Hat. So, and you, you're like in charge of making sure that all middleware is secure. So that doesn't really count. Um, it actually makes, when I started using Jax RS, it made me feel like I was a Node.js developer or, like a, or a Python developer. It's that easy to write REST services with. And then map serving, I'm doing OpenStreetMap. I'm sure at this session, everybody here has heard of OpenStreetMap. Is that correct? Yeah, do, have you not? Has anybody not heard of OpenStreetMap? I'll wrap no. it you later if you like. Yeah. And then, but I'm using tiles generated from Stamen. So Stamen Studios is one of the premier geographic design firms in the, country, in the world. And they've done a really nice um, elevation type. Uh, and I can't think of the word right now because I'm jet lagged. Oh, Topographic map. Thank you. And then, but that's, that just gives me one base layer. I, remember, from the county, I could get a whole bunch of information. So I'm using GeoServer, which is a map serving project that can talk to my PostGIS database, and I'm gonna ser serve up my own custom layers on top of those tile layers. And I think this is a lot of things people don't know they can do themselves. Right, this is a, so I included this on purpose so that people could see it. 15 minutes, great. The front end, I'm using Patternfly. Uh, so Patternfly is an open source project coming out of Red Hat, which is based on Bootstrap, but it's trying to build a unified framework for use. It, their original purpose was uh, administration consoles. So like, actually, when I showed you, that's a Patternfly-based site, right? And what you'll start, start to see out of a lot of Red Hat projects is they're gonna start looking more and more like that. But I was like, oh, that's got some nice features for me showing off like different maps and different questions. So I'm basically, and it's all open source, and the developers are really friendly on the Slack, not Rocket Chat, channel. Um, 
And they're also really active in IRC. They're everywhere. And so I was like, oh, this is a good way for me to get a lot of bang. I'm not a really good JavaScript developer. And so this was a way for me to easily get a whole bunch of components going and in a nice layout. So that's why I used it. And then um, I used Leaflet for my mapping. So I think Leaflet is the premier JavaScript mapping engine. Like, pulls from all sorts of different services, has all sorts of plugins to do really cool things. And you'll see it in a minute. So that's what I used for the front end. So again, these, are he these slides are here so that if you actually want to build something like this later, or you're like, hey, I see his Git repository, but I don't understand what's that leaflet thing, here's a link for you, OK? Any questions? We're good? Are you kind of wondering what I've built in the end? Am I building a lot of, t is it good? Is the tension good? Yeah, OK, good. So what do we get? So all of you can go look at it right now. This is why I wanted to put it on GCE, so that you can all look at it. I will warn you, it's in GCE West. And there's a lot of people seem to be checking their email or hacking code and doing stuff at this conference, so it's a bit slow. It should work on mobile devices. So if you're on your phone, it actually is probably the best, because you're not on the network here. And I will show it. I'm going to now talk us through some of the interface over here. So here it is. I can show you the REST service, but that's not as exciting. So this is what you get to when you come there to start with. There's nothing. I haven't had enough time to write anything actually coherent or interesting. But the first one you go to is birds. So with this one, what I'm doing is I'm actually pulling out of the database all the horned puffin observations. Does anybody know what a horned puffin looks like? No. What? No, that's a toucan. Oh my gosh, it's a complete, oh, not a birder, not a birder. You don't even like watch, do you watch like BBC Pl Wild Planet or anything? Oh, puffins can't even, oh, puffins can fly, but not very well. That's a horned puffin. It looks like, does not look like a fruit. If there's time left, I'm gonna show you the scarlet, Mac when it's not even a scarlet macaw, what is this, a hornbill or something? Um, that is a tufted puffin. And they generally are not, the reason I picked this one, because of a problem that I, can't, I haven't found a way to deal with, they don't occur where I live that often. They're mostly found off of Alaska, and then in the, in the winter time, out in the ocean somewhere. No one knows where they really, remember, for those of you who are in the morning session, remember him saying, like, we don't even know where this thing hangs out? This is one of those birds that no one knows where they really hang. Every once in a while, they just kind of show up near the coast, and no one knows where they are the rest of the time. So that's the horned puffin. And what we're looking at in the map interface is all the places where someone has seen a horned puffin. If you actually click on any of them, you'll see I've been including the date and how many were seen. And if you click on a bunch of them, you'll notice, and so this is where I would have liked to have played with the visualization. I would have liked to have maybe done, change the color based on year or two year span. So that you could see, is there some sort of variation in year? Almost all of those observations are from 2007. So something happened in 2007 where a bunch of puffins showed up near the coast. There's sporadic sightings other than that. And you can click around. This is somebody on a boat or someone with really good swimming capabilities and a waterproof foam. Um, but so this is eBird data being visualized. Right? So now I can say, oh, well, if I want to see a puffin, and I'll get to some of the other questions that come out of this later. So for me, this is fascinating right away. Is it fascinating for anybody else right away? Not really. It's kind of boring. That's because you don't care about birds. The next one, so you can pick. The next one, this one I picked because it's important to hear. So we'll wait, and it should clear all the pins and do new ones. Come on. Come on, network. Did it do it for anybody else? Did it work for anybody else so that they can vouch? It didn't work for you, or you didn't try it? It did it, and then it stopped working? No, well, it's, I've, I'm, my code is not production quality yet. Um, the problem that I think I've run into is I somehow I'm not closing my database connections, and I end up exhausting the connections. Oh, they were? Yeah, that was, I don't know what, I, would, I didn't mean that at all. It's totally about the hotel internet. So here's the horn, here's the request to the puffins. Yeah, it shouldn't take this long, given that all the other stuff is coming back. So actually, this is the other nice part about being here. I probably can show. So here's the service, the REST service that I built. 
that is being naughty right now, come on, PostGIS service, open up. So if I go in here, let's pick this pod, which is basically a container, and I can look at the logs, and we can see if we're throwing, yeah, we've thrown exceptions. So we've exhausted something somewhere along the way. So maybe no more of the dots are gonna work, which is really sad. Actually, you know what I'm gonna do? This is the other nice part about being in containers. Wait, I need to be in this one, right? So I can go to deployments. Oops, not that one. Sorry, deployments. And while I'm talking at you, I can just redeploy them all. And hopefully that'll flush the connections. So that's basically gonna stop all the containers and rewrite them again, and redeploy them again. And that's the other nice part about containers is there's no configuration that happens. It's all inside of the container already. And they're compiled and everything's there, so they're really fast. I'm not starting on up OS, but this is not a container talk. Let's see if that fixes it. So we can go back actually to the PostGIS service. Running, there's only one replica. There should be two. Now two replicas are running. You can see it here. There's the master, where's my PostGIS service? So there, the two haven't been deployed yet, so it's scaling down and scaling up at the same time. So maybe we'll come back to it. So what you would have seen if you had seen the shear waters is the shear waters have a very similar, oh, why are the shear waters important to you? Because the shear waters, guess where they actually, I think for us in the Northern Hemisphere, they overwinter in Australia. I mean, I think it's Tasmania, but it's certainly in Australia. Um, guess where they summer? Alaska, right? So they basically go back and forth between Alaska, yeah? What? Right, right. They, they summer all year long. In December, they summer in Tasmania. In July, they summer in Alaska. How's that? Is it working now? Yeah, it's working now. So that's on my to-do list for after, the talk, after this is to fix out why, figure out why I'm le leaking connections. It's a hibernate problem, probably. Um, all right, so they sometimes show up on their migration, they sometimes get stuck in Santa Cruz. So if you clicked on that one, that's a very different kind of behavior. The puffins are what is called an eruption. So in, the, in North America, we get that with snowy owls. You know Harry Potter's owl? So sometimes in Northern California and stuff, when the, on certain winters, there's what's called an eruption and you'll start getting snowy owls showing up really far south. That's what happens with the puffins. In certain years, they show up. The cheer waters, on the other hand, every once in a while, one of them just kind of gets knocked over into there, and so you get rare sightings. You get sightings, same number of sightings overall, five minutes. <laughs> Crap. Um, does that violate the terms of the con of, that wasn't really a, that bad of a word. Okay, the other one I wanted to show you is observers. So what that got me thinking about when I was seeing that is, oh, I didn't explain to you my custom layers underneath. So if I zoom in, this is observer number whatever. I, I'm not allowed to reveal information as part of the terms of service for that data also. The green is zoned open space or parks. So this is coming from my county data that I'm serving up on my own. The brown is agriculture, and the yellow is there's a in where I live, there's a very um, sensitive sand habitat where there's some really rare species that find there. So the yellow is zoned for that sand habitat, right? And so what you'll start to notice is I was like, oh, maybe we can show that this sand habitat has a lot of these species on it. Or maybe the open space is really critical for that. Or maybe the, the problem is we're sending, this is not random sampling. This is basically, so where do you think this person lives? Probably somewhere right about here. There's actually like 400, I think it's, let me, I have a slide that says, I think that's about 400 observations, right? So they basically walk to the same places and keep like, and oh, they only did this, this person only went out twice and recorded all that data. The next person down had, has been doing observations over a span of like five years, but still the same number of points. So if we didn't crash the database again, we should see, but we crashed the database again. So what you would have seen with this person, imagine if you will, a bunch of dots spread all over the place. Same number of points, but this person tended to go around. There's other people who they, they, that li you can see they obviously live over here and they're sampling here, but I almost find no points in here. 
So this gets me to a really interesting question for a citizen scientist, like if I was in charge of this, or, oh, maybe I'll go spend some time trying to get out there and put some points in so we can get some information. You can't say we don't have this species in open space because we never go sample in open space. Two minutes. So let's wrap it up. Uh, sorry, I, got, I got, just got excited about birds. That's the sooty shearwater. I was going to show you also the black-throated hummingbird. There's the observers, and so you can go through, if the, I get the site back up, that's showing you like how many observations and over what time span. Lesson learned on the front end, dealing with visualizing large number of points is a really hard problem. If I tried to show you all the bird observations, that's over 1,700,000 points. That makes no sense on a map, let alone how to pull that much data back and forth in a web interface, okay? Uh, cores, cross-origin requests, right? So if your front end is at a different place than your post service, your post GIS service, Bunch of things that came up about here about the larger one. The big ones I really actually want to make about this is um, there is a lot of yak shaving and learning all the different technology. So how many of you have actually tried to play with CCAM? You have? You have? If you look at the install instructions for CCAM, that is a, I don't even want to go close to that thing. I know it does a lot of stuff, but it is a mess. And so like even doing this, I spent most of my time not installing the software, which was a bonus, but I spend my time like, this isn't working in Postgres. This isn't working in Hibernate. This isn't working with the JavaScript. I don't understand. So you're going to find helpful people, is my one on that one. Give yourself more than three weeks to get it all going. I just want to give you that one, too. Um, longer, strange questions. What I want to add. And there's the final slide in case you want to get the URL. So in the end, I think this was really exciting for me. I don't think I could have built this five years ago or four years ago in three weeks or whatever time period. It would have just taken too long to get all that stuff going. On the other hand, there are still significant hurdles that we have left to try to get this in the hands of average develop. I consider myself, at best, an average developer. So the data is great, but to actually make useful applications for people and make it easy for developers to build those one-off useful things with real analysis, we still have a ways to go. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Stephen. Do we have time for questions? We have time for a couple of questions before um, afternoon tea. So I'm what's between you and tea. And I know what Commonwealth people, how Commonwealth people feel about their tea. So I only have time for one question. No questions. You must have answered all of them. All of them. Thank Absolutely you very much, Stephen. Um, Thanks. Go forth and have some afternoon tea. Yeah, Thank you and very if much. you actually, if you want to attempt some of this or you start digging into the repos, please feel free to ask me questions or you want to contribute or do anything. I would love to see more people building. That's the whole point of the open data is we get to build these things now, which are actually helpful to people, not just oh, there's a great portal with tons of data on it. So, thanks, thanks everyone. <laughs>